Um, welcome to everyone today. It's lovely to see such a crowd. Um, we almost uh, we almost need a bigger auditorium. It's it's a real pleasure for me to um, launch this important series of forums on energy security. I don't think it's lost on any of us that we've seen an escalation in awareness and concern about energy issues um, among uh, among governments, community, local communities, nations worldwide. Um, and in ensuring that development is sustainable um, across the globe. This has been, I think, a feature of the last two or three years, um, although there have been many um, more knowledgeable than ourselves who have been saying for very many years that this is an issue to which we should attend. The quest for environmental sustainability traverses all kinds of spheres of activity. There are no easy solutions, there are no clear answers um, and there are often quite difficult political decisions which face us. Many debates, many points of view, and some of them not particularly enlightening. This series of um, five forums seeks to focus on the science of energy options, not the spin, but the knowledge, and not the polemic. As we go forward, it's vital that we, as individuals and citizens, understand better what the issues are, and I think this could be called the democratic imperative of environmental sustainability, that we do participate, we do have views, we do have ideas, and we do question received wisdom. So I'd like to congratulate the College of, um, of Health and Science at the university, one of our three major colleges, and the Whitlam Institute for this initiative, and, and wish this craft well and all who sail in her. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Eric, and thank you, uh, Vice-Chancellor, for opening the proceedings. The phrase energy security uh, came into widespread currency, I think, uh, nearly 35 years ago at the time Eric was just referring to, in the mar aftermath of the first oil shock. Uh, what that was, uh, for those of us uh, not quite so uh, long on the tooth as I am, was that in late 1973, the major oil exporting countries took control over production, export and pricing of the oil they produced from the US and European domiciled global oil companies, which had controlled the industry until that time, all around the world. The immediate consequence was selective supply embargoes, which were lifted within a few months, but a quadrupling, a quadrupling also of the global price of oil, and that persisted. Since then, the term energy security has been used in many different ways to justify and explain many different policies and actions by governments, corporations and individuals. Nevertheless, despite their many differences, the various usages of the term energy security almost all have one common feature. They are concerned with the supply of energy to meet a largely unconsidered and unexamined demand. This uh, use of the, of, uh, the term possibly seen what not say is its most egregious in the attitudes of most United States policymakers, the mainstream of them, and you know, one have to, has to presume the majority of US citizens to the usage of uh, petroleum fuels for their road transport. And it's usual for debate uh, on energy policy in the public to focus almost entirely on the supply side of the energy demand and supply system, uh, and uh, what you can call it maybe a supply side bias. Uh, we see lengthy discussions over what to do about supply of petroleum or electricity or natural gas. A lot of debates advocate one or more of a variety of many different ways we might be able to get our energy, different energy sources, new technologies, and all sort of seen as a one-off solution to Australia's problems. I think the reasons for this uh, bias in thinking, we don't actually think about how much energy we use, how much we need and how we use it, is that... Um, Intellectually, it makes a convenient conceptual framework for a large volume of technical, economic, environmental and social information. There's also institutional reasons that reflects the current organisational uh, structures where we see that uh, energy supply is provided by a relatively small number of specialist businesses, some of which are very large and powerful, most of them really in a way, while demand for energy comes from every business and every community, every consumer, millions and millions of us. Supply exists to meet demand, not vice versa. Policy and planning processes which ignore demand and consider only supply of any commodity or service are certain to result in economic inefficiency and waste. I'm, I think it's appropriate to sort of 
start this detailed consideration by giving you how, my definition of energy security. I think it means that all energy users, whether they're householders, small businesses, large industries, or people or material goods being moved from one place to another, should be able to have access to supplies of energy that are sufficient, reliable, and in the correct form to meet their needs for the energy services. Uh, now I'm going to talk about how we use energy. Uh, I've found it uh, very useful. The way I think about this is to divide the way we use energy into three main uh, forms. Uh, mechanical uh, drive or motive power, and that's uh, what drives our uh, transport or any form of motile, mobile uh, equipment. Uh, and uh, so it's not only transport equipment, but also agricultural machinery, earth moving machinery, and so on. Um, a heat, and that's fairly self explanatory, it's used uh, in uh, industry uh, large amounts, used in our homes to keep us warm, to cook, make hot, take hot water, and so on. And uh, uh, the, th the third one is electricity, and that's in some ways it's a special case because it can be used for the other two purposes as well, but um, it also can be used, as we all know, for a number of uh, types of uh, applications for which you can only use electricity like electronic uh, devices. Um, Just a couple of other points about the system. I think we probably know, and I've said, most of the electricity comes from coal-fired power stations in Australia. In the, eastern, in the national electricity market, that's actually... 86% because there are a lot, with Australia there's a lot more gas in the system so that the national total is 80 to 81%. It's extraordinary high, it's one of the highest in the world. Um, but um, there are lots of other ways that electricity can be generated and I think uh, some of the other speakers and uh, lectures, other lectures later in the series will be talking a lot more about this. I'll just run down um, a list and you can you don't need to sort of try and memorize this but the, uh, this uh, coal integrated gasification combined cycle um, combined cycle gas turbine open cycle gas turbine uh, gas field reciprocating engine a biomass fueled steam or integrated gasification uh, with or without combined cycle nuclear hydro wind geothermal concentrating solar thermal photovoltaics Waves and there's a few more in the renewable portfolio that I haven't mentioned because they're uh, well, I might just mention tidal power because that has been talked about in Australia, but we don't really uh, need it, and the energy is nowhere, certainly nowhere near where we need it. The um, final thing to say about the electricity system is that it's got a long history going back. The way it's built now is to allow a small number of very large generators, mostly near coal fields, basically to distribute, to send, to transport the electricity outwards to consumers in a sort of radial way. And the rules in the National Electricity Rules, uh, I think, were really written to facilitate the perpetuation of this structure and mode of operation. And they were written by the organisations that were operating it at the time, uh, in the 1990s. And I think it would be fair to say that very little consideration was given to alternative structures that there might be for the electricity system or um, alternative modes of operation. Now, I'm not going to speculate about why that uh, might be. Some people might say it's just a failure of imagination and forethought or a sort of human, uh, nat hum nat human natural unwillingness to change established ways of doing things. Some people have more inclined towards a sort of conspiracy, say it's deliberate to protect established economic interests. Anyway, um, the important point is that I think the rules and the way of thinking that they embody are a severe impediment to the emergence of an alternative structure of the electricity system, and I'll just I'll come back to that at the, at the end of my lecture. Very briefly, the other two energy systems that I mentioned, petroleum and uh, gas. The petroleum, that also, they all have these stages, petroleum is production of crude oil, transport by ship or pipeline, to the refinery where it's turned into petroleum products which are meet the needs of what, what we use need as consumers, very wide range of different products, and then the distribution and, uh, and retailing of petroleum products. Uh, for Australia, well, for Australia, I think the most important thing about the petroleum system is, it's, 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 is that it is totally globalised and uh, that's most obviously seen in the global crude oil prices, which are always in the in newspapers and in, on the radios every morning. 
uh, and we know that they affect us because we pay the same price as everyone else in the world, unless they happen to live in a country which has special subsidy programs. And uh, the other thing, so far as Australia is concerned, is that we uh, are a net importer both of crude oil and petroleum products. We do produce crude oil and we refine, have a lot of refineries, but we're a net importer of both. And uh, altogether, uh, in the last year I looked at the statistics, they added up to 54% of our total consumption. So we're actually in the same sort of situation as the USA is in terms of very dependent on imports for uh, our petroleum uh, system. And uh, my view about this in the bigger picture is that as a net importer of petroleum, uh, Australia's got no choice but to pay the world price. It depends for its supply on the security of the world petroleum system. Uh, it, but it's also a net importer of uh, equipment and technologies used in mobile equipment, design of cars, trucks, mob, uh, agricultural machinery and so on, doesn't really happen in Australia. They're all global industries. So Australia is dependent on these global industries to, ve to develop the options which we might take us to alternatives uh, as well. So we have a definite interest in maintaining a sort of an open world economy for this, uh, I think. We can't do it on our own. Finally, the gas system, briefly, production of gas, processing of gas to make what's called pipeline gas or liquefied natural gas, LNG for export. Then it's going to be transported through transmission pipelines like with electricity and then distribution through smaller pipes to uh, final consumers. Uh, what's happened institutionally uh, similar in parallel the electricity, it's been <coughs> sort of transformed uh, institutionally and markets introduced. Um, but the other thing that's very important to affect our future uh, for uh, gas is that uh, Australia, there's now a big world trade in uh, international trade in gas and if you're an island country like Australia, you want to export gas, it's exported as liquefied natural gas. Can go a lot, can be carried a long way around the world. There's now global trade in this. It is on the way to becoming a global commodity. Uh, and I, I would say in five years' time, there'll be the price of LNG. There'll be a spot price of LNG, like there is of oil that's quoted every morning. And uh, what that's going to mean for us very shortly in this part of Australia is the gas prices will go uh, go up to meet the world level, which they're not at at the moment. And that's what the uh, for you, those of you who read the business pages, that's what the takeover bid uh, by BG for Origin Energy is about. They're all technically mature. They're tightly integrated, multi-stage processes. Broadly speaking, uh, they're based on 19th century science and discoveries in electromagnetism uh, and organic chemistry and other fields. Early 20th century engineering, the steam turbine, for electricity generation, AC transmission and distribution, petroleum drilling, petroleum refining, gas processing. All that was really in the first half of the 20th century. And the sort of logic of the IT that runs them in the centralised system, you might be called um, mid-20th century IT, centralised control and dispatch. Uh, the key uh, technical and economic characteristics as I see it, that they are characterised by significant technical and organisational economies of scale. Excuse me. The investments are large and lumpy, usually have significant environmental impacts, and they require a high level of centralised uh, control. Other characteristics of them is that they are physically vulnerable, uh, whether it's to weather or malicious uh, intent, because they have such a small number of strategic facilities and links. In that sense, they re do require a high level of social control. Uh, the workforce, relatively, is a small cadre of high-skilled people, engineers, technicians and tradespeople, mostly with very specialised skills. And then two other points about the uh, consumers, which I think is very important, is what I think that we've got what I would call a cultural disconnection between final consumers and the means and sources of supply. By that I mean is not you here, because you obviously have an interest, but the average person does really doesn't know and doesn't think and possibly doesn't care very much about where their electricity is coming from or where their gas is coming from when they turn on the switch or the uh, tap. And they don't know that there's this enormous system that stands 
behind that, and I and but and they also don't know that when they do turn on the switch, that does have an implication. Just that little bit more coal's burnt back at the power station, and that little bit few more molecules of CO2 go up the uh, uh, up the uh, flue. Uh, and this is not accidental. This has been the whole uh, thrust of the technology development uh, of the at least the last uh, half century. Uh, sort of a we're encouraged, don't you worry about that. The industry will look after you, after you. And that comes from the people in the industry, but of course it comes very much from politicians as well. Uh, we're told, you know, uh, we'll, we'll keep the lights on for you, don't you uh, worry about uh, that. And I think uh, there's also a, a, a more sort of deeper disconnection as well. It brings with it a disconnect from the natural world uh, and its resources and the recognition that we do ultimately depend on the finite resources of the world if you're not using renewable energy. Uh, so the next um, uh, 10 minutes, the end of my time, I want to talk about the, uh, the future. Will these energy systems that I've been describing be able to ensure that in the years to come, Australian businesses and households continue to have access to supplies of energy that are sufficient reliable and in the correct form, that was the definition I used at the beginning, to meet their needs, that is to provide energy security. I don't think they're very well placed to do that at all. And uh, I think that uh, we really need to think about that in terms of what I say is the two major long-term threats to our energy security. And I think there's two of those. There's the greenhouse gas emissions issue and there's also the question about the availability of petroleum that's sometimes referred to as the peak oil uh, issue. And uh, I won't, it's not pro in this lecture sort of to go on to why I think they are really important. I will, all I'd just say is that uh, even if you have doubts about maybe the scientific reality of either of all those, I think that uh, what you'd call a prudent risk management approach to the future of a society and indeed of the planet uh, demands that you should actually act uh, as if they would, they are, that is correct, because there's certainly uh, a, a quite a high probability, even everyone would uh, admit that, 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 that they are correct. But so how do we think about, how are we going to do that if that's what we're going to do? Well, just, it's very simple in terms of there's just two broad approaches. One, you reduce the demand for energy by using it more efficiently, using less energy to produce all the services we need. And secondly, you shut change the way we supply the energy to move away from current technologies which produce a lot of emissions to technologies which use lower emissions. A few things about uh, energy uh, efficiency, there's just abundant evidence from all sorts of uh, studies all around the world what a big potential there is. Now there are enormous opportunities to use uh, electricity more efficiently in houses and commercial buildings which you might remember use more than half of all the electricity that we consume. And just a couple of, um, well, one particular example, uh, which I know about, a building in Canberra, it's owned by um, Australian Ethical Investment, uh, it was a 20-year-old building. They refurbished it, a commercial office building of three stories, I think. Uh, they refurbished it in, the, in a way to achieve high efficiency, and reaches what's called a six-star uh, standard. Uh, the, ref the refurbishment didn't cost any more than a, a conventional comprehensive uh, refurbishment and new uh, fit out per square metre of the office building. Their energy consumption is one third of the buildings next door. There's five of them that are the same. Uh, and they are the only one that's changed and their energy consumption is only one third. And what it means is we're going to have to have a fundamental transformation of the electricity supply system, which uh, is really the third stage of the history of the electricity industry. The first stage was when it started in the late 19th century, multiple what called islanded little grid, little distribution systems. Each town had its little generator, or each suburb uh, in a city originally, very short distance to distribute the electricity. Then the first uh, half of the 20th century, we saw grids built and all this interconnected in Australia uh, at the state level, the interconnection was sort of pretty well complete by the end of the 1950s, and we had these, we moved to these big centralised uh, power stations, the system that I've described. And um, what we're now moving on to, we will need to move to, but there are a bit of 
schools in the in the rules and all sorts of the way the institutions are set up at the moment is a networked grid. You might think that's more like the internet, really. Multiple small generators distributed all over the grid, some close to what centres of demand, uh, for example, combined heat and power, others located where the resource is, for example, wind. Uh, and I think it's striking that uh, this these ideas feature so little in the public debate about our electricity future. It will be easier in terms of the choice of entirely feasible technology options to reduce our emissions from electricity than actually then from our use of heat and mobile equipment. I haven't sort of justified that in detail, but I think you can pick up from some of the things I'm saying. But the uh, low energy electricity system will have to be transformed. And that will involve enormous changes to investment patterns, workforce training and skills, and cultural attitudes to an understanding of how we supply and use energy. Uh, electricity will cost more, but it actually won't be more than it now costs in uh, most of Europe, in Japan, and in many parts of the USA. The whole object of having higher electricity prices is to bring about structural change in the economy, to actually get some of those uh, industries that use a lot of electricity maybe to form a smaller part, to be just actually to to shrink, to lose out. That's actually a necessary part of the process coming through because consumers will buy less ultimately of those products because they'll cost more. Move towards a structure that has inherently lower greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that won't be catastrophic to the economy, but even though you hear a lot of loud lobbying saying that it will be. And if we succeed in transforming our electricity system, I think the new system will be far more diverse, more ge geographically dispersed, that will make it less vulnerable to disruptions by storms, fires, floods and other natural events, but also less vulnerable to malicious human attack. And it will therefore provide greater energy security in terms of physical supply of electricity is concerned. I'm hoping today to not in any way repeat what Hugh has uh, said. Uh, Hugh's paper is very learned and uh, will be there as a permanent record. I'm simply here to try and trigger your responses or to get your minds running about what your part might be in energy security. Um, if there was a blockade of Australia, not impossible, would the lights go out or could we keep them working? Um, uh, fundamentally, uh, there's a very close mix, and the first dot point I've got there, between the, the technology scenarios ahead, and Hugh has touched on a number of those, and Hugh concluded by saying, and I share his view, that those scenarios that you and certainly the younger of you amongst you are going to see will be extraordinarily different from the central, almost the central command economy uh, structure, the paradigm that we that we have to this day, and which, as Hugh has, Hugh has told us, is to some extent enshrined in the law and regulations as a continuum. Those things will change politically and realistically. They will change. But security is tied up enormously with uh, one of the other great challenges of today, and I share Hugh's view, I, I, I happen to believe the scientists, at least I'm not strong enough to disbelieve the scientists, and uh, I think the precautionary pr principle is, is something that uh, we cannot do without. But, as I'll come to in a later slide, I think if we do adopt some of the things that, uh, and, and the, the, the great reductions with various market and other incentives uh, in the amount of energy used, we'll in fact have a much nicer world. To, to, to live in. There's no way we can continue on as we are now, although we're doing, I'm certainly doing precious little about it. I turn on the heating in my home because I don't get too many signals to tell me not to. Uh, renewables have enormous potential um, and there is a lot of research work we can do. Solar energy, well, uh, most of you know all this, but the rooftop photovoltaic, I think will be, which is now a bit peculiar, wealthy people have it, um, it's a bit strange, it's a very novel thing you talk about at dinner parties. I think that will be standard technology in 20 years' time. Roofs will not be made of bricks and mortar. There'll be, there'll be mini power stations of two to three or maybe four or five kilowatts interconnected with the system. That's all I'll say on that slide. This is where it's all coming from, and that all means every single one of you, not just the government, it's all of you. So thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Left on me to say. But I guess as a final respondent, I would like to take a slightly different, albeit entirely complementary approach to that that uh, Hugh and Martin have already uh, done. And 
I guess uh, I'd like to begin by trying to extend the classical definition that Hugh gave us when he set the scene so comprehensively, and that is to acknowledge that energy security, uh, sorry, energy supply and consumption, regardless of the technologies that we choose, and all of those technologies were fairly comprehensively outlined by Martin, of course, must be balanced against other key issues as part of our thoughts about security. So what are the issues there do we need to think about? Well, the two main ones, uh, and of course there are others that you could also add to that uh, Venn diagram that I've got on the left of the, uh, the screen there, are of course environmental issues, the waste that we generate, for example, and societal issues, what compromises are we as a society willing to make? Now, in the environmental context, I would sound a warning to the effect that we must not just think about the impacts of the energy generation itself, but in fact take an all-of-life perspective to assessing our energy generation uh, scenarios. And in fact, thinking about sustainability and security requires us to think about the impact of building energy generating infrastructure as well as dealing with the wastes that that energy generation process itself uh, leads to. Now, in the next few slides, I'd like to take a look at some of the consumption issues from the perspective of five countries that are clearly shown on the map there. Australia, for obvious reasons, to locate us in the world. The United States, which as you can see there, and as many of us probably uh, believe is a, a rather heavy consumer of energy and energy resources. Japan, France and China. And China in particular because it's one of the upcoming powerhouses that we all note and take note of every time we look at the newspapers. Okay, well let's begin by comparing how our usage of energy has evolved over the past 25 years on a per capita basis for every man, woman and child in the country. Now, historically, the USA has been the biggest per capita user of energy due largely to their extensive and uh, much-used transportation infrastructure, and I'll show that towards the end of the talk. However, I think we'd have to say that Australians are rapidly catching up, as you can see by the green trace there. And these plots suggest that we, we actually run the very real risk of overtaking the United States in the race to become the highest per capita users of energy, if you can believe those numbers. Now, by far the lowest here is China, although we can see that they are also starting to ramp up. OK, well, let's move away from those raw numbers and take a closer look at some of the technologies that Martin was talking about uh, that we use to generate electricity. Now, electricity generation is by no means the biggest producer of greenhouse gases, but indeed it is a very important part of that waste mix. And this plot here summarises the amount of CO2 generated per kilowatt hour of power generated as a function of a selection of various technologies, including uh, non-renewables and also some of the renewables that Martin mentioned as well. Now, in my penultimate slide, I'd just like to have a quick look at uh, how our usages of energy are predicted to scale over the next uh, 20 to 30 years. Indeed, Hugh has gone into this in much more detail than I've gone here. But suffice it to say that uh, the big players in this game are still predicted to be China, and the USA into the future, and Australia will, uh, is predicted to be really a long way down in that particular scenario. It's interesting, but to look at how the various nations are using that power. And whereas most of us uh, have most of our energy being consumed in industrial heavy industries, uh, as you can see in the cases of, the, uh, of China, Japan, and Australia there, transportation is in fact, is currently and is predicted to remain the major use of energy in the United States. So in that sense, the United States is a little bit different and special uh, than the rest of us. Well, I'd like to conclude just by reminding us what we're all worried about when we're talking about energy security and all of the issues surrounding energy generation. Now, Martin mentioned in one of his slides uh, the fact that we're all after a much nicer world uh, through our considering energy security and the various ways in which we go about generating energy. Now, as evidenced by the slide we've got here, which looks at both a built environment on the left and natural environment on the left, I happen to think that we already, in so many ways, live in a pretty nice world. And the challenge is to find ways to keep it that way or, if possible, to improve it. So I'd like to leave it there. Thank you very much. So in closing, uh, this is the first of five. Go out and buy your tickets. Make sure you get suits for the next one, which is going to be a bit of a buzz, I think. Uh, we've got petroleum and fossil fuels um, with uh, Dr. Beverly Ronalds from CSIRO, head of the petroleum group and uh, group executive, Ian Dunlop, from the, uh, who's actually going to be speaking about peak oil and gas, which terrified me when I spoke with him on the phone. Um, so if you like horror movies, this is the one. Uh, and finally, Dr. Alan Lowe, who's the chief technologist with the um, 
Cooperative Research Centre for Coal and Sustainable Development. So it's going to be a very, very good uh, episode, that one. Uh, <laughs>